Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, which is a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. I'm well, I'm ple very pleased to welcome back our guest uh, from last uh, our last uh, show, Toby Kincaid, for another episode. And uh, he's an author, inventor, founder, and an electric vehicle charging systems visionary. So Toby, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hello. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking a story about a winning team, batteries and fuel cells. Most people think that batteries compete with fuel cells, but actually they are a winning team. They work together. They have the various characteristics. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find out why they're a team here today with Toby. So Toby, let's launch off uh, and start talking about a winning team, batteries and fuel cells. Wonderful. I, I first have to say our hearts go out uh, to Maui, to everyone in Hawaii. It, what a gut punch. And uh, hey, folks, we got to change this. We got to fix it. Let's honor them. Let's fix it. So we could start with that, I think. I, I just right. wanted to say we're heartbroken. But uh, in the first slide, you know, I, I wanted to label it, but I, I just couldn't. It, what's the point here? It, it's the earth and humanity. And the earth, you know, Mitch, you're a long time sailor, your whole life, you're, you're a Navy man. So the idea of a vessel, of a ship to you is, is hardwired. And, and I wanted to label this, this uh, sketch, save our ship. We, we are in big trouble here. We're burning up, we're in a heat wave. We've been burned out, Paradise, California. Now in the middle of the ocean, you guys are getting the, the, the full, weight of our carbon addiction. So uh, I just wanted to start with that, that uh, this is the point. And I was going to draw lots of people because there's 8 billion souls aboard our ship. But I just drew one because it's the dignity of the individual that is our cause. That's our, that's the most important thing. So starting that way, I just want to say our hearts go out. So, uh, you know, uh, we only have one planet Earth. And it's uh, almost like a lifeboat for us. So like uh, having um, been a captain of a ship in my previous life, you know, you're out there a thousand miles away from shore and that's all you have. So if you screw up, you know, you may last in the lifeboats for like a month if you're lucky, if you eat each other. You know, you read stories about people being in lifeboats. But, you know, we have to take care of our lifeboat. We, we don't have a planet B. So uh, this is uh, this is what it's all about. So you're totally right. We have lots of humanity, and uh, we owe it to you know people to uh, come up with solutions uh, that work and uh, are sustainable. Absolutely. So in in our next slide, let's let's talk about how are we going to win? How are we going to beat this? So here's our Earth, and then we have three aspects of our civilization. We have our economy, the environment, which we all depend on and our energy paradigm. And unfortunately, everything is in opposition. The economy, we can't get low cost energy, it's the volatile pricing, can't plan. And then when we burn the energy, we destroy the environment, which our economy depends on for agriculture and everything else. So what's the common denominator between these three realms? Well, water. We're mostly made of water, the earth is mostly covered with water, but water is the key to unlock our future. So uh, I just wanted to mention that there is evidence, there is a common denominator, and if we work in this common denominator, we can get to the right answer. So next slide, please. Okay. All right, so here's our problem. For 300 years, we're burning carbon, and the oceans and atmosphere and lands have been absorbing and absorbing and absorbing, but now this is it. We're what the chemists call saturated. We are super saturated. So on the left side of this column, this is what we've been doing for a very, very long time. And it's based on carbon. You know, how do you like your hydrogen? The energy is in the hydrogen, but how do you like it? Do you like it stuck to carbon? Or can we have it stuck to oxygen? Because it's an entirely different paradigm. You get a lot of energy and we can solve all of our problems. But I'm kind of nerding out a little bit because it's the chemistry what we need that we need to change. We need to move over to the right-hand side of this column. And we can base everything on water. And right now, as we, we talked about earlier, 
44% of all the clean water in the country goes where? To agriculture? No. That's number two. Number one is cooling down thermal power plants. You know, we run on steam engines. Folks, we've been doing steam engines for hundreds of years. It's over. And the problem with a steam engine is you have to have a boiler, so you've got to burn fuel or split atoms. And then you have that condenser. you got to cool it down so that the steam can return to water and come back and be boiled again. So we put rivers of water to cool it down, 44% just wasted. Some of it gets evaporated, and then it, it, you're left with highly high mineralization, and so it becomes a condensate. Ah, it's a big mess. Okay. And we we so, throw a lot of it away, too. It's such a valuable resource. Oh, incredible. So when you hear people saying, hey, we got to go to steam engines or nuclear, which is a steam engine, hey, just call them out on the water. Where are you going to get the 12 million gallons an hour per gigawatt? Wow. That's Where are you going to get it? Come on. It, 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 it's, it, it's the last century. We're in a new century now. So we need well, to. Different. In Hawaii, you know, we don't have a lot of spare water right now. We've, you know, mm. uh, not fresh water. We have, we're surrounded by ocean and seawater, but of course that takes energy to distill it if we're gonna to try to get fresh water, we need fresh water. And so uh, what was uh, demonstrated in the Maui fires is they were running out of water to fight fires. And, uh, you know, that's just one example of why, why water is so precious and why we need to conserve it. And we certainly don't need to be using it just to cool a thermal plant and then throwing it away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in this world, doesn't fit at all. So, so let's uh, let's go to the next slide yeah, and talk let's about jump our in. favorite subject, which are batteries <laughs> and fuel cells. And I just want to make the point once again that you know, even though I'm a fuel cell and hydrogen guy, I'm not a high, I'm not a battery hater at all, because they each have their use and their value proposition. And one of the things we want to talk about is, you know, are we uh, using the right value proposition for some of the uh, applications that we're using them in, or should we be adjusting it? to match their their value uh, for providing the overall solution and not uh, forgetting something. I mean, like going totally overboard on hydrogen or going totally overboard on uh, the, um, the batteries because uh, hydrogen vehicles have pretty big batteries in them themselves. So I'll stop Absolutely. talking and let you uh, carry on with that uh, theme there. Uh, well, you know, that last show, we talked about some of the big problems, and there are big challenges if you think of everything being battery powered. So there's a place for everything and an application and a use case, which makes the most sense. So I put these kind of problems up and I flipped it around like a question. So let's just look at the left side of this graph and you, you'll see that, you know, what's a big problem? Lack of materials. Can we, do we have enough battery material for all just the cars? Not even just the cars. Well, there's a billion and a half of them. It's a lot of cars. Right. So that's a problem. Huge loads on the grid. That's a problem because it, you're charging these cars in a fast charge with, you know, 30 to 300 houses worth of power. So that's yeah. a lot of capacity that you're going to put into one vehicle. So next problem, are there unscheduled loads? Well, yeah. When are you going to charge? The operator doesn't know. The system operator has to kind of look for patterns, plan for capacity and bring those online. But if we're charging with, in, you know, just 150 kilowatt fast charge is 30 houses. So it doesn't take many vehicles to really kind of be a big thing. So unscheduled loads, problem. The next thing is toxic sources. You know, I, I hate to say this, but we're all burning some toxic sources in our grid. Very few are actually 100%. And in Hawaii, I mean, you're in the middle of the ocean but you have the most expensive and the dirtiest grid in the whole fleet. So I know that you're dealing with reality, but we're gonna move this reality and move the goalposts so we can, we can clean this whole up, the whole thing. So the next big problem is grid overload. I mean, we're talking about a thousand cars, a million cars. If you're talking about DC fast charges, the way you wanna do it, mm, the numbers get really tough, really fast, very expensive. California says, they're going to need $50 billion in grid upgrade just to handle the 12 million new battery cars they expect by 2030. So 50,000 million before you do anything, that's what you've got to pay. Who's going to pay this? Well, everybody, we're all going to pay this. So these problems are, 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 are significant. I'm sorry, you're going to. Well, I was just going to say, are we actually going to have 12 million cars by 2030? That's only like six years away from now. 
Yeah, so, that's a little. You know, how bit. fast can we respond to all this? So you know, let's not. We need to. We need to have a bit of reality as well. And, and what we're trying, you know, our aspirations are great, but there is a reality that you know it takes time to do all this stuff. You don't just, you know, add, you know, you know, triple or quadruple your sextuplet your grid in like six years. I mean, that's just impossible. Well, it's trillions of dollars, so I don't know where that's yeah. going to come from. So, right. and and then there's even other problems. There's the idea of when you want to power with solar, you actually have to be connected to the car. Solar is real time. So if you're not connected, we call that a capacity factor mismatch. You know, the sun right. isn't up 24 hours a day. It's up for a few hours. So how available a resource is really does matter. So we start building up all of these barriers. And for a couple of million cars, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed you can get that far. But the idea that we're going to decarbonize our transportation sector with batteries, mm, uh, that's really uh, hard math to make work. And, and the last little thing on this list is the charging time, which I would argue is not a problem. If you're parked for hours, you can level two charge just right. fine. It's the DC fast charge, which I'm a fan of. I work in the, in the industry. But there is a reality to it, as you point out. And so on this chart, when I list all of these major barriers on the left side, and then on the right side, let's ask, well, if you had a green hydrogen fuel cell paradigm, do you have a lack of materials? No. Uh, I will say some fuel cells, the PEM type, proton exchange membrane, they like to have as much uh, power density and energy density as possible in these devices. So we use a little bit exotic materials, iridium, platinum. You don't have to, that's just the best. And as with batteries, this chemistry is evolving. But is there a fundamental lack to fuel cells and electrolyzers? No. Material well, I'd like to make fun. a point here. I'd like to yeah. make a point is... You know, you don't throw the platinum away. Like they can recover 98 to 99 percent, or maybe all of the platinum when it's it's over. So it's not like you're throwing this stuff away. I don't that's know about iridium, but uh, no, no, exactly. That. No, that's why they're stealing all the all the catalytic converters. Do you need exactly? To, what do you, you think they're doing with those? <laughs> so you know, the, as far as a material kind of you know making, we have enough that's not going to stop us from from electrifying transportation that's what we're trying to do but we got to do every sector every segment aviation maritime uh, light medium and heavy duties this is a tall order and we're not making enough progress so when we look at this chart and you compare the fuel cell which is the, the electric vehicle you never hear about you always hear about batteries in fact when in the discussion in the media they just assume you mean a battery right. no, no, no no there is one other kind which makes the energy on uh, well in real time so actually, you're using a 1% battery and 99% fuel cell. And we'll talk about that in a bit versus 100% battery. But when you go down this list with the fuel cells, are there lack of materials? No. Huge loads on the grid? No. There, it doesn't touch the grid during peak time, only off peak. Are there unscheduled loads? No, because it's you can fuel any time from the hydrogen. So right. it's not grid connected in the real time. So you know, are there toxic sources of, of electricity? No, because it's green hydrogen. It's clean hydrogen. By, we make that with, with renewables, with solar and wind. That's the green electron. And then you add that to the electrolyzer with water, and you have oxygen and hydrogen. Let the oxygen go. The hydrogen's there. You dry it, filter it, put it in a bottle, ready to go. Perfect so, cycle. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's straightforward. And, and you've got uh, uh, no grid overloads. We've got no capacity fast factor mismatch because 100% of the time, you're connected to the green uh, sources of electricity that are the that drive this. Now you can connect to the grid and use other people's excess renewable, and that's a variation. But when we look at the this, this chart, all of these seven problems are 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 not trivial. They're they're big and they're expensive. But right. on the fuel cell side, it doesn't even come up. So right. hmm, everyone wants to go on the left side. Maybe they're just not aware yet that the the fuel cell vehicle is beautiful. It's quiet. It's clean. It's powerful. You fill up in five minutes. You have 350, 400 miles range now with these extended, they're having larger tanks. You know, what a vehicle. But the important thing is it's not just for cars. You can run anything with a fuel cell. Anything you have a diesel engine in, pull it out, put in a diesel, uh, a fuel cell stack, 
a fuel cell engine, you're good to go. And that's what I love about your system because we could take it anywhere and provide fuel directly for medium and heavy duty vehicles, which everyone in the battery world is saying, oh, you know, we'll get to it eventually. But hey, folks, we've got six years. That's what the IPCC says. And we still right. here in Oregon, we're still making goals about mid-century. I just want to shake them. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're not going to get there. We've got, we have this decade, and if we fail, we fail everyone. So, so let's talk about the guy who's got a fleet of vehicles, because you know one of the early applications, particularly for light duty vehicles and heavy duty vehicles, is is fleet fleets vehicle fleets, and uh, you know one of the things is you know you know from the point of view of infrastructure, you know if you have a fleet of vehicles, you have one set of charging infrastructure or fueling infrastructure, you can service many cars as opposed to like the way we have it now for light duty gasoline vehicles and and what they're looking at is some of the chargers you got all this distributed charging or fueling uh spread around so let's talk a little bit about the fleet operator and this is i'll let you do the talking there well i you know i i love fleet managers because right. they're the ones who are going to save the world it's the fleets you know when we make a, a decision about our own car that's our own car but when you talk about a fleet the fleet manager is very well aware well, you have to maintain this vehicle, fuel this vehicle, change the oil, do everything you need to do to keep these cars running. And so I thought, well, maybe as an example, we could take a fleet example, very small. Of course, this is just a, an example. And it's just one, one type of vehicle. So let's say 100 cars, and each car is going to go 600 miles a month. So you need 60,000 miles. How are you going to do it? What's the best way to do it? So let's, let's grab the next slide. So this is what we're trying to do. And, and here are th we put we discussed five clean options last show. I, it was getting crowded on the on the slide, so I just drew three at a time. But the first right. option is level two and level. There's three levels: one, two, and three. Three is DC fast charge. Level one is from your wall socket, 120 volts, very slow, but there. Level two is faster, about up to seven kilowatts, and around 20 to 25 miles per hour as a charge rate. Now. Level one and level two are actually both AC charging. And that's interesting because the battery is DC. So what's happening? Well, the charger, the, it's a rectifier. That's how you go from AC to DC. That's actually in these small powers. You can put it in the car. That, was a, that way, that level two, you just actually, it's like a big light switch. You're putting AC power into the car. The charging equipment is in the car. Now, when you get to DC fast charge, now you're talking about big power and it's DC to DC. So that big power is so, the, the, uh, the equipment is so large, you can't put it in the car. So it's gotta be at the station. So level A, the solution A is just level two, very easy to do. And I said for this hundred cars, let's use 25 dispensers. So they come, I'm imagining they all come to the parking lot in the morning, they can charge a bit, but you still don't have a hundred, you only have 25, so you have to share. But if you add up the seven kilowatts to 25, you get to about 175 kilowatts. That's the peak. Now that's kind of okay. If you're under 200 kilowatts, no grid upgrade probably is going to ever happen. Right. So you're good with, with that. But now when you go to, the, to select, uh, section B and we go to DC fast charge, now let's take our hypothetical fleet and let's say, okay, we don't need 25 level twos. Let's use 10 DC fast charge. Now, maybe you can get away with five, but we're servicing 100 vehicles. So I thought, okay, well, 10 seems kind of reasonable. Well... You get a great advantage because you have much faster charging, so you're not using so much time. And in right. the, the level two, it took 2,400 hours of charging, which is, sounds kind of rough, but hey, 24 hours per month per vehicle, it, doable when you're right. parking. But when you get to level, when you get to DC fast charge, man, we're talking about power because the only way you can fast charge a big battery is brute force. You just have to push it in hard and when you do that it's a lot of power so our 10 dispensers now have a peak rating if they're all used at once at one and a half megawatts now that's a lot of power for a parking lot you're going to need some upgrade upgrade probably for that yeah so so you get some advantage in the user experience but we're talking about hardware we're talking about infrastructure you now have to support that and let me tell you it's a it's a heck of an electric bill right so, so in, in level two and then DC fast charge, you have an electric bill. Okay, then we get to your system, which I'm a big fan of, as maybe you can tell. 
But I love direct fueling because now you can use green hydrogen. Now we can use renewable energy to make clean hydrogen fuel from water. And that's done in a machine called an electrolyzer. So right. once you have the hydrogen, it comes out a little bit wet from an electrolyzer. So it has to be dried through desiccant. Then you filter it. Then you put it in a bottle. You compress it and stick it in a bottle. And once it's sitting in the bottle, it's completely inert. It doesn't do any chemistry. It'll sit there for maybe a century. Years. Long. It can, yeah, it can, yeah. It can decades. Last years. It just sits there. It's it, for long-term storage, which lithium batteries cannot do. Oh, hydrogen. See, hydrogen is nature's battery. It's the perfect battery. It has 60 times more energy density than lithium ion, three times more energy density than gasoline. So if you want to run big machines, and we have big machines, hey, hydrogen's your way. But I love your third the system here because now we're really talking about the big picture. We're talking about how we're actually going to provide an infrastructure that can move us around in our modern lifestyle. So we're not going to give that up. The only problem is the fuel is toxic. Just change the fuel. <laughs> and that means you've seen some machines, but it's not like you have to change everything. We're just talking about swapping out the engines. That's not crazy. Right. So I'm, I'm really happy about that system. So uh, let's, uh, what do we have? Uh, well, next... let's talk about the team now, the team approach. Yeah, it sounds like okay. we're bashing batteries. So let's talk about how they all work together. Well, that's right. I mean, what, you, what you've had is the, the battery camp and the fuel cell camp, and they haven't been getting along, and the infrastructure is different. So you almost have to pick your poison. So in this little cartoon, and thank you for encouraging me, this is my attempt at one, you see on the top, you see a battery and a fuel cell, yay. And But Elon Musk's idea and everyone following him is, hey, let the battery do all the work, 100% of the time. And if it goes down 50%, hey, carry it with you. You got to carry all this dead weight. So look at this little battery, he's sweating in it. And the fuel cell, hey, hey I'll just sit in the back, go ahead and, and take me through the park. You know, I love the park. You know, this is really just a, Crazy stuff, right? But the truth is, they don't have to be in opposition. They can work together. And look at those guys fly down the road when they're working together. See, the battery is great for what a battery is great at. Running electronics, quick transition, high power density in the moment. So if you want to accelerate, it's going to pull on the battery. But just enough to get you going. Then the fuel cell gets up to speed and goes, oh, I'll take it from here. And now the fuel cell takes it over and the battery goes, whew, that's great. Now I can... I can get charged. And so, of course, the fuel cell charges the battery. And so you only put hydrogen in this car. It doesn't take very long. It's five minutes. And, uh, and it, doesn't, it doesn't weigh a ton. Yes. Like that's basically, a big... uh, the, oh. Some of the fuel cells in cars, they weigh actually a ton. And then you look at some of the R&D in the car companies. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to take the weight out of the vehicle. So they go to magnesium engine blocks and aluminum, uh, you know, uh, body parts everything to get the weight out and then they add this humongous you know one ton battery to the equation and it doesn't go away when you use it it stays yes and if you're talking about big trucks you're talking about big batteries and try and fast charge a big battery now there's a new standard coming out called megawatt charging standard and this is for the the big trucks they want to do but they're not having much luck with it. I think the Pepsi did the first group with battery trucks and the chargers weren't really up to speed. But we're talking about a megawatt and a half for one vehicle. Oh, that's, uh, yeah, that's yeah. 300 houses of capacity. Um, you know, we have 2 million trucks. Yeah. Right. You know, look, we, folks, we don't have 50 years. If you had 50 years, I'd say knock yourself out, have fun. Right. We don't have 50 years, we have six. So if we're gonna do this, Oh, we got to get serious and really push. I mean, here in Oregon, bless their hearts, but our policy makers, they're talking about goals in the mid-century still. No, you're not going to get there. And setting goals for what your children are going to do. No, 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 no. Folks, 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 please. Let's get serious. And we can save this world. We can save ourselves. We can save the species. But you got to get off the addiction of oil. It's that simple. Right. But our federal well, let's government... move on to oh, our oh, yeah, universal yeah. hydrogen station, which is the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, this is where number four, and this is the one I love. I mean, uh, this is really something. Oh, now, first, this is, I'm, I'm looking at the screen. This is the little island picture, yeah? Oh, no, no. no. Okay, no, no, I got it. Yeah, great. So what are we doing here? We're doing what you're doing. We're taking solar and wind. We're making green electrons. We know how to do that, but it's in real time, so you got to do something. So we right. add water. 
And now the water and the electrons go in the electrolyzer. They produce oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen gets vented. The hydrogen goes into a system where we dry it, filter it, put it in a bottle. And now you have everything because you can dispense that fuel directly as you've pioneered. We can put it in the medium and heavy duty vehicles and aviation and maritime. But if you want electricity to power a building or a commercial process or DC fast charge without touching the grid, then we just run it through a fuel cell. So you take the oxygen back out of the air, the hydrogen you stored, it releases the electricity and returns back to water. So bingo, you're not overloading the grid. It's a standalone system that is not connected to the grid at all, but can produce the massive power required to recharge these uh, you know, fast chargers you know, for these big trucks and heavy duty vehicles. Exactly. So that's, a, that's a perfect application here. So you've covered the whole the, 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 the whole menu of uh, vehicles that can be charged at that station. That's why we call it a universal uh, hydrogen station. It could be just a universal energy station. Maybe we need to change the title on this slide. <laughs> yes, and, and these are being developed. There, there's a, uh, let me tell you about a variation. There's a company in New Zealand, uh, Innovation, uh, what is it? Renewable Innovations, I believe. And they use a, like a 40 foot container and they're using a big fuel cell stack to drive what they call rapid charge, what's New Zealand, we call it fast charge. But for the hydrogen, what they're doing is they're making the hydrogen at some facility where the, it makes sense for them to do it, where they have the scale to do it. Then they load that hydrogen onto a tube trailer and then they bring it to this 40 foot container and they put it in the, in the right. container and lock it down and vent it. And now you have instant DC fast charge. So that variation is really nice. Now, with the screen, with the, with the universal station, this is being developed by EV4 in Oregon. And he's adding the, Hans Vandermeer is adding the fuel cell stack to a hydrogen station. And that kind of is what makes it a universal platform. Because now you, whatever you're doing, whatever vehicle you have, you can use this station. So it's kind of bringing together the battery world and the fuel cell world and saying, hey guys, we're not in opposition. Let's work together. We're and a team. I, we're a team. So and, and teams we're, we're, win ball games. Right. Not so individual. we're kind of uh, getting to towards the end of it. So I oh. want to skip over the next two slides and go to our last slide where we talk about the economics and the value added proposition. So okay. Now this is for what we talked about last week, which is you know what does a gasoline station sell? Gas. <laughs> what does a charging station sell? Electrons. So for me, it's a, not a gas station, it's an E station. So if you're gonna power an E station with the sun, what would you call it? Well, a sun E station, sunny station. Uh oh, a sunny right. station. So what's important about this picture is not what things cost, but what you avoid. So the idea here is that you're gonna put uh, these solar power level two chargers in parking lots all around the island. And what you don't have, and I'm gonna pull this up so I can see it, I can't quite see the screen. But with, with, what it, what's important here is what you don't pay for. All of the 15 categories, there's no electric bill, there's no connecting to the grid. There's no survey that has to be done so they can determine, can we connect you to the grid? These just require a parking lot that you, that you drop down. There's no trenching from the electrical source. There's no electric bill, of course. Uh, there's no unknown costs. There's no future impacts that you don't know about. So there's no unknowns. This is a really practical, reliable thing. And the amazing thing is how productive it is. Each station can put in at level two, can put in about 80 miles a day in Hawaii per station. Now there are 30 days in a month. So that's an incredible 2,400 miles of 100% clean mobility that comes from a station in a parking lot. And it's got a beautiful canopy. There are different manufacturers, different vendors. You could take your pick. This is my favorite because I just love the design of it and its practicality. But what's really amazing to me is 400 of these stations would produce a million miles a month of clean mobility from the sun. Oh, right. that's wonderful. Now it's not fast charge. So this is the case where you go to work and you're gonna, or you're going shopping or you're going to lunch or something where you, you park for a little while. Right. And if it's right there, just plug in. So right. for battery cars, I think the solar charging is a tremendous opportunity that Hawaii and us, everyone around the world should be putting solar chargers in their parking lots because it makes a lot of sense right. to do it. It's practical, it's there, and it's potent. 
And okay, one last well, with those happy oh. words, I, I oh. hope we've demonstrated to everybody the uh, teamwork between batteries and fuel cells and hydrogen and universal energy stations that we need to do that or the sunny station. <laughs> so we're going to have to leave it there because you know what? We ran out of time again. So I'm going to ah. have to bring you back, Toby. Uh, so I've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been talking story with Toby Kincaid, inventor, author, um, publisher, you name it, he's done it, about the combination of batteries and fuel cells and transportation systems and how they are really a winning team. So thanks for uh, participating, Toby. Thank you. And wow. thank you to our viewers for tuning in. I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii, the state of clean energy. So aloha, everyone, and have a great two weeks.